All right, everybody, welcome to Math with Grace. Hello, everybody. Today we're going to be going over Geometry, Book 103, Section 102, basically pages 2 through 36. All right, If we, as we get started here on Book 3, we need to get our vocabulary hats on, all right? Uh, but please remember, page 87 is your Postulates and Theorems page that can be used on uh, your quizzes and tests. Section 1 of this book is all about angle definitions and measurements. And we first need to know a few things about definitions, all right? Definitions will help in identifying and classifying angles. Measurement will allow us to add and subtract angles, all right? An angle is the union of two non-collinear rays that have a common endpoint, okay? Here we have ray BA and ray BC. Together, they make an angle, all right? The two rays that form the angle are called the sides, and the common endpoint is called the vertex. Okay, this is all vocabulary we need to become familiar with. We're going to be using it a lot. Here's how we delineate angle as we're writing. I think um, we did that last week when I was uh, writing a bit of a proof, right? It's this little backward L looking thing, or I just make kind of like a less than sign. All right, so here we have ray ST and ray SR. They have the same endpoint. S is our vertex. ST and SR are the sides of this angle number two, okay? All right, it says, notice that when we use three letters to name an angle, the vertex angle is always in the center. This is very important, okay? If we were to name this angle right here, we would name it, angle D A E. All right. Or you could name it angle E A D. All right. You can go here to here to here or here to here here. Though either one of these is the same angle, but the A has got to be in the center. The vertex is always in the center. Okay. If you just write angle A, it could be any of these things. All right. Oh, I'm going to look for angle A. You can't do that. You've got to be specific. And to be specific, we use the three, three letters, always with the vertex in the center. Okay? An acute angle is an angle whose measure is less than 90 degrees. So an acute angle goes from 0 degrees to 90 degrees. Okay? A right angle is an angle that, that measures 90 degrees total. Exactly 90 degrees. Okay? Okay? And it's delineated with this little box. We've talked about that before. An obtuse angle is an angle with a measure greater than 90 degrees. So any angle greater than 90 degrees, but less than 180 degrees, right? The bisector of an angle is a ray that is in the interior of the angle, so inside the angle, and divides the angle into two angles of equal measurement. So BD is a bisector only if ABD, only if the measure of angle ABD is equal to the measure of angle DBC. Okay, that is the only way that BD can be the bisector, but a bisector of an angle is always, in this case, a ray. All right, let's take a look at some of these problems. All right, so problems one, two, three, we're gonna do together. Number one reads, state four ways of naming this angle. All right, well, let's start with our angle sign and we'll name it angle R, S, T. And of course I wrote this first, R, S, T, okay? Then remember, like I said on the other page, we can do the reverse, so angle T, S, R. Now, in this case, because there is no angle related to it, we can actually say angle S. Where on, like this drawing here, we couldn't just say angle B because there's more than one part to angle B. But here, we just have angle S, so we could name it angle S. And the final way of naming this one 
because they put a little number one inside there, we could actually call this angle one. All right, because they marked this already with a one, we could call this angle one. All right, number two reads, what point is the vertex of the angle? Now remember, the vertex of the angle is the point that our two side rays have in common, okay? Our two rays have in common one point, and that point is S. That is the vertex of this angle. Three says name the sides of this angle, okay? Remember, the sides of an angle are always a ray. So we have ray SR and ray ST. Remember, when we write the name of a ray, the end point always comes first, okay? And that end point here is S. Good job. All right, our next bit of vocab starts on page six, and that is the word perpendicular, all right? Perpendicular lines are two lines that intersect such that the four angles formed are equal to each other. Each one of these angles is equal to each other. And if we think of this as a circle, we know that this is 360 degrees, right? Because a circle has is 360 degrees. And if we divide 360 by, three, by 4, we get 90. Therefore, each one of these angles is 90 degrees. So if you have two lines that intersect each other, and they tell you that one angle is 90 degrees, you can easily state that any of these would be 90 degrees because perpendicular lines form 90 degree angles, okay? That's just what they do. That is the definition of a perpendicular line. All right, then we switch over to the next page. We get, again, my favorite word in geometry, and that is between this. Betweenness of rays means that for any angle AOC, OB is between OA and OC. And all three have the same endpoint. And they don't actually have that drawing here, so let's draw it. Okay, so for any angle, okay, any angle AOC. C. Here's our angle. Any angle AOC or any angle of any measure, okay? Any name. They're saying that OB, okay? OB is betweenness of OA and OC when they all have to have the same endpoint. When OB is on the interior, which is in this part here, Okay, and angle AOB plus angle BOC would equal our original big angle, remember, AOC. Okay, so the two parts together would equal the, main, the original angle. So let's look at some of those examples because between this can be kind of weird. But here's one, okay? We have our angle NMP. And then we have MQ. MQ is betweenness or between NM and MP. Okay. Same here. We've got COE. Well, OD is betweenness. It falls in the interior. If we took the two parts, they equal the whole. Okay. But looking at this one, ABC, and then we've got Ray BD. Yes. The ray shares an, the same endpoint or same vertex, okay? But it's not in the interior portion of this angle. Therefore, it is not betweenness. It's sticky outiness, okay? Not betweenness because it's not in the interior. Now, I want to look at problem 13 on page 8, and I've already drawn in my lines, but it says draw parallel or sorry, draw perpendicular lines to line L. Okay, here's line L. This is this line that's on the paper through these different points, A, B, C, D. Now, eventually you'll learn how to actually make perfectly perpendicular lines. But today, they just want you to use a ruler and demonstrate what it would look like if they were perpendicular. 
So they don't have to be perfect. Don't freak out. Eventually you will learn how to do that. I think it's book seven. All right, so I marked them with the little box delineation because perpendicular lines make 90 degree angles, right? So you're just gonna pull out your little ruler and draw the four lines. Piece of cake, that part's piece of cake. Let's look at part B. What does inductive reasoning tell you about these lines? So what can we learn about these lines that you just drew? What can we think? Well, if this line is 90 degrees to our main line, and so is this one, and so is this one, and so is this one, they're all traveling in the same direction, but will they ever cross each other? Will they ever turn from this 90 degree perpendicularness to this right original line? No, they won't. They are parallel lines. These lines that we drew are all, all parallel to each other. They will never cross each other. They'll continue on and on in the same direction forever and ever. Amen. Because they are all parallel to this one line, or because, I'm sorry, because they are all perpendicular to this one line, they are parallel to each other. All right? Good job. If we look at the bottom of page nine, we've got our first postulate, and that's postulate six. And it reads that every angle corresponds with a unique real number of degrees greater than zero and less than 180. This is the angle measure measurement postulate. This is what allows us to add angles together um, to find out the size of larger angles. Okay, so let's take a look at that more in depth. Turning the page, we get to page 10 and we've got postulate 7. All right, postulate seven, it says the set of rays on the same side of a line with a common endpoint. So here's our line. Here's a whole bunch of rays. Okay, they all have this common endpoint. Can be put in a one to one correspondence with real numbers from one to 180 inclusive in such a way that, now these are a lot of words. We'll break it down to something. It can be simple. Let's just read through it and then we'll talk about it. Such that, okay, that one of the two opposite rays lying in the line is paired with zero and the other is paired with 180. That's this one. This is the only set of opposite rays. Remember, opposite rays form a collinear line, right? That's the whole point of opposite rays. They make a line. The points are collinear. There's only one set. And it's going to be at zero or 180, and and honestly, because protractors work this way, it's it's got the 180 on both sides and the zero on both sides, right? Okay. Also, that the measurement of any angle whose sides are rays, that given set is equal to absolute value of the difference between the numbers corresponding to its sides. Okay. So the absolute value thing is kind of confusing and I don't recommend it. I'm gonna teach you how to use your protractor properly and then we don't need to worry about the absolute value thing. Because if you look on page 11, it goes into this absolute value and it makes it very complicated. It makes something that can be easy, very complicated. So I'm gonna show you um, the right way to use your protractor, and a lot of times I'll call it a contractor just because I can't remember what it's called, <laughs> but this absolute value stuff is hard, and so I try to avoid it. All right, let's take a look at the drawing at the bottom of page 11. So I have two uh, protractors, and I tend to really like this little tiny one here um, for doing work in the book. This one's great too but this one it works out really nice, except for the fact that it always breaks. I can't, I bought like six of these. Anyway, um, this one, you might have, if you have a larger one like this, you might have to extend the lines first um, so that it will reach your protractor, but just be careful when you're extending your lines that you make sure you're doing it nice and straight so that it can actually reach um, the measurements of yours. Okay, I guess it would be down here. So it'll actually reach all the way up there. Um, but if you've got a little one, it works pretty good. 
because this one points right at all the good stuff. Okay, so that being said, let's take a look at this um, drawing here on the bottom of page 11. And let's talk about it. They actually have it marked as at this being zero over here. And here we have 180 and you know, therefore that's counting around this way. And so what they want you to do with this absolute value point is that if they want to know what the angle measurement is of DOC, they want you to take your 120 and subtract the 80 and that's just a lot of work, okay? It, it's just a lot of work. So if we look, or if they want the measure of O or sorry, Z O E. Again, they want you to take 180 and subtract 140, and that's how you'll get the measure. But if you use your protractor correctly, you don't have to do all of that. Okay, so here's your zero, here's your vertexes of everything, right? So on your protractor, there should be a point or where there's a perpendicular line or a cross. On these bigger ones, there's actually like a hole. There's a hole in it. And that hole is what you would line up there. For me, I don't have the hole in this tiny one. So I'm going to line up that cross there. And then I'm going to line these two lines up with the base, with the opposite rays. Okay, make sure they're nice and straight. So as you can see, I do have a zero here. The same place they have a zero. But I also have 180. So... When you're measuring, you always want to take where you start at zero. So if I'm measuring this first angle right here, then I would start at zero because I'm not going to start at 180. That doesn't make sense, right? We don't count at 180 and down. We count it from zero up. But if I'm starting over here and I want to measure this angle that's over on this side, I would just start at this zero. See how it has a zero on both sides? So don't get confused when you're measuring these out. There's a zero here. I would start at this zero and count up to 140 where this one crosses. Okay, or, or 40, not 140. I would count up to 40 where this one crosses. 0, 10, 20, 30, 40. Okay. Here we've got one that crosses at 60. If we were taking the measure of D O Z, we could easily line up our protractor and see that D crosses at 60. Okay, now I was saying they're going to ask you these middle ones, right? What's my secret here? Well, here's the secret. If you consider whichever one of these outer edges to be set it to zero, okay? So put your point, still it has to be at the vertex, but make that outer edge your zero, okay? Now my outer edge is at zero, so if I want to find the measure of this angle that's just here in the middle of all this mess, I measure it. And the measure of my angle is 40 degrees. Now I'm a little off, but 42 degrees, maybe. But the measure of this angle is 40 degrees, okay? The measure of DOB, which is right in the center of all this mess, is from zero to 60 degrees. Okay. All you have to do is turn your protractor. It's a much easier than all this absolute value stuff. Okay, If I wanted to find the measure of COB, I line up my protractor at my vertex. I set my outer edge, OC, here to zero. And then I look to see where B crosses. And BOB crosses at my broken part, which is at 20 degrees. Okay, so just turn your protractor. There's no reason to do all this math. I love math. I'm here teaching you math. I love math. But sometimes this stuff can just be too much, all right, when we have a simple solution for it. So let's take a look at some of these problems. All right, so I would like to look at a problem 121. It's actually on page 12, but you need this drawing to do the problem, so that kind of frustrates me when they don't put the drawing on the same page as the work. Um, but I still want to take a look at it, so I wrote it all out here separate, and we're going to do these one by one based on the drawing on page 11, okay? 
the first measurement that they want you to find is the measurement of AOX. Now remember, the center letter is always the vertex, so the center letter of all of these better be O, because O is the only vertex we have in this drawing, okay? So AOX, remember that's the same thing as XOA, so it's written right on here, right? Here's the zero, and it goes up to 40. That tells us that this angle, AOX, is 40 degrees. And make sure when you write it, you put your little degree symbol on there. It's just a tiny little O, okay? The next one that they want to know is BOX. So B-O-X. Now this angle is quite a bit larger, a little bit larger, right? But they still have it marked on here already. We don't even need to use our protractor yet. And they tell us that that angle is at 60 degrees. All right, then they want come in between and they want to know what is the measure of BOA. Now, simply done, we could easily do math and figure that out, but I want you to get comfortable using your protractor and okay, so you're gonna set your cross at zero and set your outer leg, okay? You're gonna set your opposite angle portion, the bottom line here, at the zero mark, okay? I'm using the inside zero mark this time, at zero. So we've got our A, our OA at zero, and we want to go to this OB. Those are our outer sides of our angle. And if we go up to OB, that tells us it's 20 degrees. Remember, don't start at 180. You start at zero. No matter which side you use, you start at zero. So we go up to the 20, and we know that that angle is 20 degrees. All right? The next one we're looking for is COB. COB. Again, this one's right in the middle, so we're going to use our protractor. We're going to set up our outside at OB, okay? Here's our OB is set at zero. Now we can move over to our OC, which is 20 degrees away. So again, that's another 20 degree angle for COB, all right? Letter E wants us to find the measurement of DOX. Here is D. O, X. This one they gave us right here on the chart, right? Here it is. It goes whoosh, all around here. It's 120 degrees. Some of these they have written right on there. Others we have to figure out. Letter F asks us to find the measure of BOE. Well, where's BOE? B-O-E. Okay, this is a big chunk here right in the center. Pull out our protractor, we line our crosshair on our vertex, and our zero on OB, because that's one of our outside angles, okay? Now that our zero is on OB, as best I can get it, we'll follow our zero, that's where we're starting, around to E. E is over here, it's kind of hidden, I know. Um, so we're gonna go all the way around here following our zero line or the inside set of numbers this time and we see that E basically crosses at 80 degrees. So we know that that angle is 80 degrees from here to here. All right, I'm gonna erase these arrows before they start to get to be too much. All right, the next one they want us to find the measure for is the EOD. Okay, so here's our E, O, D. All right, this time I'm gonna set O, E to my zero mark. Okay, so I line up on my vertex. I've got my zero on E. E, O, D gets us from zero to 20 degrees. So we know that that is a 20 degree angle. Good job. H is the measure of AOD. So where's our A? AOD. So again, we're stuck in this inside. I'm gonna take the, the left-hand side this time and I'm gonna line up my zero because it really doesn't matter whether you line up with OA or OD, whichever side you wanna choose. I'm gonna line my zero, this time it's the outside zero, 
on D, and I'm going to swing around and around over here to A, and it's basically, this drawing's a little off, but it's basically 80 degrees. All right, so that angle is 80 degrees. And the last one that we're going to go over using our protractor here is the measure for angle AOC. This is letter I. A O C. Okay, we'll line up our crosshairs on our vertex, and I'm going to line up my right hand zero here on A or O A. Okay, and then that takes us to now. If you were trying to be be precise, it would be what 41 degrees maybe, but basically it's 40 degrees. Okay. We're rounding. It's okay for this drawing. We'll be more specific next time, but we've got our outer edge, our zero on A, okay? And we just follow the zero. Remember, if you're starting at zero, you go with that zero. We're not gonna start at 180 and count down. That defeats the purpose. So we start with our zero and we see that our C crosses at 40. Okay, so that's how you use your protractor Yes, there's a lot of information in Postulate 7. No, you probably won't be using it very much just because it's a massive amount of work just to do something we can simply do with the tool that we've been given, which is the protractor. Okay, let's look at the next topic. All right, our first theorem of this book is Theorem 3.1. Imagine that. All right, and it tells us that if ray OA lies between ray OB and OC, then the measure of angle BOA plus the measure of angle o or AOC equals the measure of BOC. So they're saying if this angle comes in between these two, if this, sorry, if this ray comes in between these two rays, then the two angles created by this ray equal the angle measurement of the large ray, okay? It's like if you had a cookie and you broke it in half, those two halves still together, or not even in half, if you just broke a chunk off, those two pieces still together make a whole cookie, right? It's just that now we've got two pieces. Now this ray here kind of looks like it's pretty much in the center, but that's not really what they're talking about here. This could be, this could have been ray over here. And still the same practice would have been um, true, right? These two parts of this angle would still equal the larger angle altogether, or the two parts of the cookie would still equal the cookie, right? It's just that they're not broken equally. It's the same thing. It doesn't have to be equal. It's not, we're not talking about a bisector. We're just talking about between this, basically. We're adding the angles back together. We broke them, we're adding them back together. Now, what I want you to notice here on page 13 under this theorem is they go through a proof. All right, this is a proof, and we're going to be writing a bunch of these soon. But they go through a proof explaining how that this can be true. I am not going to be going through these proofs with you that prove the theorem that we just talked about. We are going to trust that the theorem is true. Please feel free to look through this proof if you want to see exactly how they came up with that theorem. But sometimes these can be overcomplicated because they're trying to prove something um, basic definition type stuff. So it's very complicated. So, but you feel free to read through it if you would like to. Turning the page to page 14, at the top of the page, we have something that's very important. And it says it's marked with a remember box as if some point in your history of math, you were taught this information and maybe you were and maybe you weren't. Um, but I'm not gonna teach it like it's something you remember from the past. Um, Let's look at it like it's something you have no idea about because that probably is where we're sitting right now. And we're talking still about adding angles together. And if you think about um, out to sea, I'm sure you've watched in your history some kind of 
uh, nautical movie where they're on the ocean and they're talking about degrees and minutes and seconds as their measurements for where they need to travel. Well, this is where it comes from. And we're going to be doing some of that. But this is, ba and you do need to remember, you do need to remember this. This is important. If you have a hard time um, memorizing things, go ahead and write this on your theorem and postulates page as a note so that you have this information, okay? But basically the little circle represents degrees. The, the one chick mark is what I'm gonna call it, is the, equals minutes and two chick marks equals seconds, okay? The, that's what those are referencing. So here we're saying that one degree is equal to 60 minutes, okay? And one minute, of course, is equal to 60 seconds. We know all that. Um, so here we have that one minute equals one sixtieth of a degree. Basically, it's the opposite of this, right? One degree is 60 minutes. So if you only have one minute, you have one sixtieth of a degree because degrees are larger than minutes. Same here. If you have one second, you've got one sixtieth of a minute right? One second is one sixtieth of a minute because it takes 60 seconds to equal a minute, okay? It's the opposites here. This one is the is a bit different. Because a second is so much smaller than a degree, one second equals one three thousand six hundredth of a degree, okay? And there will become times where we need to put these into practice. So I want to take a look at model one here. And model one gives us this angle RST. And it says RST is equal to 35 degrees, 48 minutes, 36 seconds. Okay, this is very nautical type stuff. And they want you to tell them how many degrees that is. They don't want the minutes and seconds. They want it only as degrees. Okay, so by adding all of these together, because they're all part of the direction, we can find out what the actual degree is, but we can't add unlike numbers, right? You know, we have to add like numbers. So we need to change these all to degrees. They all have to be degrees, then we can add them all together. So obviously our 35 degrees is not gonna change. But here we have 48 minutes. Now remember that one minute is 1 60th of a degree. So if we have 48 minutes, we don't really have a whole degree yet because we haven't got to 60. So we can just put that 48 over the 60 and now we have degrees. So 48 minutes is the same as 48 60th degrees. All right, 36 seconds. Again, we don't have a full degree. We've got only part of a degree. Because remember, seconds are that much tinier than a degree. So again, we just put it into the fraction that we were given. Um, and I'm pointing at it, but I see that it's not on the screen. Dope. Okay, we put it into the fraction that we were given up here at the top of the page. So 36 seconds is the same as 36 over 360, 3,600 hundredths degrees. <laughs> okay. Then they just used their calculator and figured out the decimal equivalent of those degrees and then added them all together. So 35 degrees, 48 minutes, 36 seconds is the same as 35.81 degrees. All right, that's how they changed from minutes and seconds to degrees so they could add them all together. All right now, when we're adding time, which is something you should be familiar with, you want to make sure you add the seconds and add the minutes and add the degrees together individually, right? And then, of course, where our seconds go over 60, we need to change, change that. We need to reduce it. And here in this example, our seconds were 73. So they changed that to one minute, 13 seconds, right? Because that's what it is. 60 seconds is a minute, so they got one minute, and then there were 13 seconds left over, okay? Then they came down here and they added their, oh, right here, they added their extra minute, right? So they added up all these minutes, plus the extra one they had here, gave us gave them 68 minutes. Well, it's there's only 60 minutes in one degree, so they were able to take out one degree, and they were left with eight minutes. 
then they took their one degree and they put it over here and added it to their total of degrees. So the answer for this problem, the final complete answer is 50 degrees, eight minutes, 13 seconds. And I believe that's written at the top of the next page, 15. Um, but again, I like to have my answer on the same page as my illustration. Okay, so, and you can't even see it. All right, so they've added all these together. They simplified where they needed to, and that came up with their answer, 50 degrees, eight minutes, 13 seconds. We're going to be doing some of these math problems in the future. One other thing I want to just review real quick is subtracting. Sometimes we're going to need to subtract um, these measurements. But remember, when we're subtracting, we can't subtract 30 from 15, right? If I only have 15 candies, I can't give you 30. It just doesn't work that way. So we have to borrow. And when we're borrowing, make sure you're borrowing the correct amount. When you borrow one minute from here and make this 11 minutes, you're actually borrowing 60 seconds because that's what we're going down to, seconds. So you have to add 60 seconds to this and it makes it a 75. Same thing here when you're borrowing, and of course I covered it, but the example is all here. When you're borrowing here, because now we can't take 20 from 11, we've got to borrow one degree. So we're gonna borrow one degree, but one degree is 60 minutes. So we're adding 60 to this 11, that's gonna give us 71 minutes now. Okay, so when you're borrowing, make sure you're converting because you can't just borrow one minute and tack it on here and have it be, you know, 16 seconds because that doesn't convert properly. When you borrow a minute, you're borrowing 60 seconds. Now I wanna take a look at a couple of problems here. We're gonna start on page 16 and look at number 132. 132 asks us to express two thirds of a degree in minutes. Okay, so we need to change this over to minutes. So we have to remember that two thirds of a, a degree, it's not even one whole degree, right? And if you think back to your measurement conversions, we know that one degree equals 60 seconds. So if this is not one whole degree, then we don't even have 60 seconds here. So how we figure this out is we're gonna take two thirds of 60 seconds. We'll just put that over one so they both are fractions. Now, we can reduce here. There's one three and three. How many threes are in 60? Well, there's two threes and six and zero and zero. So there's 20 threes and 60. Now that we have reduced as much as we can, we can multiply across. We multiply numerator times numerator, and that gives us 40, and denominator times denominator is one, but we can get rid of that one because any number over one is just that number, right? So we know that 2 thirds of a degree is 40 minutes. All right, let's take a look at 133. 133 asks us what fractional the part of a degree is 45 minutes. Now, when they say fractional, that means they want their answer as a fraction. So they don't want decimals, they want their answer as a fraction. So what part of a degree is 45 minutes? Well, we know that one degree equals, or sorry, one <laughs> minute equals one sixtieth of a degree, right? So if we put our minutes over 60, we will get our degree. So now we have 45, it's 45 sixtieth of a degree, right? But we can reduce that. What number does 45 and 60 have in common um, that we can reduce with? Well, they've got their greatest common factor is 15, right? So if we take out 15 out of each, 15 goes into 45 three times, and 15 goes into 60 four times. So we know that 45 minutes is three-fourths of a degree. Make sure you're marking your unit of measure on these problems. Okay, the next one that I want to take a look at is problem 136. 
Now 136 is a um, addition problem. It says use this diagram, and there's a diagram on the page, to write the required information. So they tell us that the measure of angle ROS, make sure you're looking on your page 16, is equals 20 degrees, 15 minutes, 40 seconds, and that the measure of angle SOT equals 10 degrees, 12 minutes, 30 seconds, all right? And they want us to figure out the measure of ROT. Now, I'm just gonna draw a rudimentary example of this drawing. It looks a little something like this. Right? So, ROS we know, SOT we know, they want us to, to they want us to find ROT. So that involves adding ROS to SOT and then we'll have ROT. I know it's a lot of letters, but just keep it going here. So, we're going to add 20 degrees, 15 minutes, 40 seconds to 10 degrees, 12 minutes. 30 seconds. All right, we're doing addition here, straight up. So first we're gonna add our seconds, and our seconds give us 40 plus 30, which is 70 seconds, right? Zero plus zero is zero, four plus three is seven. Now we know that this is more than a minute. So what we need to do is we need to subtract out our minute and that leaves us with one minute, 10 seconds, right? So now let's add our minutes. Five and two is seven. One plus one is two. We need to add this extra minute back in over here. So we actually have 28 minutes, all right? Now that doesn't go over the second limit, so we don't need to worry about that. Zero plus zero is zero. Two plus one is three. Our total answer for the measure of angle ROT is equal to 30 degrees, 28 minutes, and then we've got our extra 10 seconds over here, 10 seconds. Okay, again, make sure you're marking your label of measurement, your unit of measurement. Okay, that was an addition problem. We had to simplify our seconds down to one minute and 10 seconds. Okay, let's take a look at one more. 37. 37 tells us that the measure of angle ROS is 41 degrees, 12 minutes, and that the measure of angle ROT is 62 degrees, 8 minutes, 12 seconds. All right, they want us to find the measure of angle SOT. So ROS is given to us and ROT is given to us and they want us to find the one here. So we've got this much and we've got the whole. So if we take this part out of the whole, then we'll know what the other part is. And that means we need to subtract. So we're always gonna take our largest measurement, which is the full angle, ROT. So we're gonna take 62 degrees, eight minutes, 12 seconds and subtract 41 degrees, 12 minutes. All right, just like with subtraction in other units of measure, if we don't have a match here, it just falls down. So our 12 seconds just falls down. It's basically 12 minus zero, right? But here we have an issue because we can't subtract 12 from eight. We have to borrow, we have to borrow one degree Okay, oh my gosh, we have to borrow one degree, which makes this a 61 now. But one degree is the same as 60 minutes. So we can't just put a one in front of here, we have to add 60. 68 minutes is now what we have, okay? Now we can subtract 68 minus 12. Eight minus two is six, don't forget your minute marker. 6 minus 1 is 5, okay? And then over here, we can subtract. 1 minus 1 is 0. 
six minus four is two. So our final answer for the measure of SOT is 20 degrees, 56 minutes, 12 seconds. And that brings us to the end of section one. Okay, section two begins on page 20, and it's all about angle relationships and theorems. Okay, so again, we're going to step into a bunch of definitions and then work on some problems, okay? And it says that angles can be related in many ways to each other, but and they can be related by position or by measure. Those are two ways they can be related to each other, two ways we're going to discuss now, all right? Adjacent angles is the first thing we're going to talk about. And adjacent angles are two angles in the same plane that have a common vertex, a common side, and no interior points in common. So there's four things that make adjacent angles, okay? The rays that are on the outside of adjacent angles are called exterior sides. COB and BOA are adjacent angles. They have a common vertex, they're in the same plane. They have a common side, and that common side is OB, right? C-O-B, B-O-A, they have that common side. And they don't share any interior points. Remember, the interior points is what would be between the two sides. Okay, so let's look at it one part by one part. First, they must be in the same plane. These angles are not adjacent. They are not in the same plane. Therefore, they are not considered adjacent angles. Okay? Second, they have to have a common vertex. While these angles share a side, they do not share a common vertex. So they are not adjacent angles. Top of page 21 shows us that they have to have a common side. AOB and COD are not adjacent angles. Yes, they share a vertex and they are on the same plane, but they do not share a common side, okay? They don't actually, one sides don't actually touch each other. And then fourth, they cannot have any interior points together. So AOB is not an um, adjacent angle with AOC. That's not how it works. AOB is adjacent to BOC, but you can't have an angle inside of a larger angle. That does not make them adjacent. They have to share no interior points. Good job. Now, here are some specific type of angles that we need to become familiar with. This starts on page 22. And the first are complementary angles. And they're two angles with measures that, when added together, equal 90 degrees. Complementary angles add up to 90 degrees, but they do not need to be adjacent angles. Here we've got um, an illustration of two angles that are separate, completely separate from each other, but they are still complementary because their measurements add up to be 90 degrees. And looking at this example, we have adjacent angles and together they equal 90 degrees, so therefore they are complementary. So anytime two angles have a measure added together that equals 90, they are complementary angles, all right? The next one is supplementary angles. Now, sometimes we can get these two words confused, so we just need to practice their meanings, okay? Complementary, 90 degrees. Supplementary means that their two measures added together equals 180 degrees or makes two opposite rays, okay? So again, they do not need to be adjacent to each other. Here's an example of a 110 degree angle and a 70 degree angle. They are supplementary because together they make 180 degrees. But here we do have adjacent angles and together they make 180 degrees and their out, outer sides create two opposite rays, all right? And the next vocabulary word are vertical angles. And vertical angles are two angles with sides that form two pairs of opposite rays. So basically vertical angles are created when we've got two lines intersecting at any degree, okay? Here it tells us that AOB, AOB, and COD 
are vertical angles. So these two lines cross each other and the vertical angles are these that are kind of opposite each other. That's what a vertical angle equals. Two and four are vertical angles. Angle one and angle three are vertical angles. All right, and we'll learn in the future that vertical angles are equal. That means angle one is equal to angle three because that's the definition of vertical angles, okay? That being said, I wanna take a look at the problems at the top of page 24. It says, on the blank, write the letter for each correct answer. 2.1 reads, angles with measures that add to 90 degrees. Okay, we just talked about these, right? Complementary angles add up to be 90 degrees. 2.2, two, angles with sides that form two pairs of opposite rays. Okay, there's our clue. Two pairs of opposite rays are formed, okay, by vertical angles. Okay, let's mark these off as we go. Vertical, we just learned that on the page before this, right? Vertical angles, when they cross, they form two sets of opposite rays. So those are vertical angles. 2.3, angles in the same plane with a common vertex, a common side, but no common interior points. All right, what are those? What are those? Right, those are adjacent angles, remember? Adjacent angles have to be in the same plane. They have to have a common vertex. They have to share a side, but cannot share interior points, okay? 2.4, angles with measures that add to 180. Well, when we're adding angles up to 180, those are supplementary angles, or letter C, right? So these are all important vocabulary words that we're gonna need to um, memorize, and trust me, you're gonna have lots of practice doing it. All right, our next topic is on the bottom or the middle of page 24, and it's theorems. And we're gonna spend the next several pages discussing theorems and like I said, after each one, they actually give you a proof as to how that theorem is solved. Feel free to read through those, but I don't need you. You don't need to worry about memorizing. Those proofs are much harder than the proofs that we're going to start off doing, okay? But the theorems you do need to know. So please use your postulate and theorem page at the end of the book um, as your note card so that you can keep track of what we're learning here. There's lots. There's going to be a lot of theorems, and it's a lot to learn. If you keep that page with you, you will, you should succeed. All right, theorem three, two. If the exterior sides of two adjacent angles are opposite rays, then the angles are supplementary. Remember when we talked about supplementary angles and that if they are adjacent, they form opposite rays, right? So here is a theorem stating that if you have two angles that are adjacent, they share this side, right? And they have opposite rays, then these angles are supplementary. Now, we obviously don't know the measure of either one of these angles, but we do know that together they equal 180 degrees. Two adjacent rays, okay, they're on the same plane, they share a side, but in this case, their exterior sides form opposite rays making this supplementary. We know that this is half a circle, right? 180 degrees. That's theorem 3.2. Theorem 3.3 should sound familiar to you because we talked about this a while ago, a little few pages back, right? Theorem 3.3, if two lines are perpendicular, then they form right angles, okay? If two lines are perpendicular, remember when we had to draw those perpendicular lines? They form right angles. That is just the definition of per perpendicular lines. Two lines are perpendicular, they form right angles. Every single one of these is a right angle. They all add up to 360 degrees. Boom, okay? If two lines are perpendicular, they form right angles. You might be wondering why we're learning all these theorems, but all these theorems will be important in the future when we start writing proofs of our own um, and like I said, these proofs that they're giving you are kind of complicated because they're trying to prove basic um, 
you know, foundations of geometry. And so they do have to use a bit more complicated steps. Our proofs shouldn't be that hard as we move forward, but we need to know these theorems because these theorems are gonna be our reason. They're gonna fall into our reason side, okay? Theorem three, four. If two adjacent angles have their exterior sides in perpendicular lines, then the angles are complementary. So if we know that line M is perpendicular to line L, okay, then the adjacent angle AO, uh, I don't know, X, let's just call it, AOX and XOB, because they fall inside the perpendicular lines, we know that they are complementary angles, that they equal 90 degrees, because we know that this is 90 degrees, because perpendicular lines make right angles. Right angles equal 90 degrees. Okay, you see how that they get that? Because these two adjacent line angles fall in between these perpendicular lines, this they are complementary. They equal 90 degrees because perpendicular lines make 90 degree angles. Okay, you see how we're adding in here the connections between these? That's theorem 3, 4. All right, theorem 3.5 is a little bit more complicated, so we're going to break it down, but I'm going to read it to you first just as it is. If two angles are supplementary to the same angle or equal angles, then they are equal to each other. Okay, so they're basically saying, they're giving you the fact here that angle two and angle three are supplementary, and angle one and angle three are supplementary. Okay, so remember, when we're talking about supplementary, they have to equal 180 degrees, right? Together, they equal 180 degrees. So if two and three are supplementary, and one and three are supplementary, because three doesn't change, one and two have to be equal, okay? They have to be exactly the same size angle because they're filling the, ex the same size space. We can't go over 180 degrees. They're filling this space right here, and there is only so much space here. Three doesn't change, so that amount of space doesn't change. So if two is supplementary to three and one is supplementary to three, then one and two must be the exact same size. Okay, does that make sense? So that's what this theorem 3.5 is telling us. If two angles are supplementary to the same angle or to an angle equal angles, okay, usually it's just the same angle, or if let's just say this angle was, was 120 degrees and angle one was, you know, supplementary to a different 120 degree angle, okay, it's still, we still have the same amount of space here as we have here. So then these two angles are equal to each other. All right, that's theorem 3.5. Okay, theorem 3.6. If two angles are complementary to the same angle or equal angles, then they are equal to each other. This is exactly the same theorem basically as 3.5, except now we're talking about complementary angles. And remember, complementary means they are equal to 90 degrees. So it's saying that two and three are complementary, one and three are complementary. There's only so much space that here that can be fit into this 90 degrees, right? So if two fits and one fits into this space that doesn't change, then one and two must be equal to each other. Okay, it's exact same type of theorem as theorem 3.5, except now we're talking about complementary angles. Now, problem 2.5 that's on the same page um, you can feel free to look at how I did it. You do not need to solve this theorem or this proof. This proof is rather complicated, but this is basically how you would solve it if I was asking you to. But you do not need to do this problem as part of your homework. All right? All right, so theorem 3.7 I mentioned a little bit earlier, and it states that if two lines intersect, the vertical angles formed are equal. Now remember, when two lines intersect, the vertical angles are the angles opposite each other. So three and four are vertical angles, one and two are vertical angles, okay? They're the opposite angles. Now, 
um, if we take a look at this, it makes perfect sense, right? Vertical angles are equal. These are creating the same size space on both opposite angles. So angle three is equal to angle four. Angle one is equal to angle two. Now, again, they have the proof here. Feel free to read through why this is the case, but theorems are things that have been proven. We know and we can trust them. So I don't see a point in working through all of this. Um, we can just say if two lines intersect, the vertical angles formed are equal and you will be using this theorem a lot going forward. All right, let's take a look at one of the practice problems. All right, for this problems here at the bottom of page 29, they want you to use this diagram to answer the questions. We're gonna do the first two together, but I want you to pay attention to the fact that you're given that PZ is perpendicular to AB. So ray PZ, right here, this one that goes up, is perpendicular to line AB. So right away, I'm just gonna go ahead and mark this with a right angle marker. Because if this is a right angle, then I know this is a right angle because 180, which is what we have here all together, minus 90 is 90, right? So we know that perpendicular lines create right angles or 90 degree angles. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark it. I was given that information. I know it to be true, so I'm gonna go ahead and mark it on my illustration so that I can see it with my eyes. I like to see things, okay? So then for question 2.6, they ask two right angles. They want you to name two right angles. Well, we just marked two, basically we marked two, we marked one, but that marks the other as well. So they want us to name them. So we know that angle Z, P, B is a right angle and also angle Z, P, A, right? Z, P, B, Z, P, A, those are both right angles. Now, 2.7, they want us to mark an obtuse angle. Do you remember what obtuse angles are? They're angles that are larger than 90, but less than 180. So if we got out our imaginary protractor, we would know that if we went from B to Z, that's 90 degrees, right? Because we've marked it. So it's gotta be farther than that. So we can say with confidence that angle B, P, remember our vertex always goes in the middle, W, B, P, W is an obtuse angle. It's greater than 90, but less than this 180. Okay, good job. All right, the next set of problems I wanna look at is on page 30, and it gives us this diagram, and it asks you a whole bunch of questions about it, okay? But I want to just look at a couple of those questions, and that's 17 and 18. 17 asks us, what are two adjacent complementary angles? So remember, what does complementary mean? Complementary means that they need to add up to 90 degrees, and they need to be adjacent. So first of all, we need to look through here. B is 110 and it's not adjacent to anything. Here we've got a whole bunch of stuff inside of A, but together they only equal 70 degrees. D is a 90 degree angle, and then C is cut in half or in portions, and it's a 30 and a 60. So we need to take a look at this one because 30 and 60 equals 90 degrees, right? And these angles are adjacent to each other. So those are the ones that we need. So now we need to label them. In this shape, they've only given us the vertex of the shape itself, but those are the letters that we're going to use to label our angles. So we know that the two complementary adjacent angles are angle B, C, A, B, C, A, okay? and angle A, C, D, A, C, D. That gives us our two adjacent complementary angles. All right, 218 asks us for any supplementary angle. So we are looking for a supplementary 
angle for DAB? Well, first of all, how big is DAB? DAB is this, is all of these. Well, 40 plus 30 is 70. So we know that DAB equals 70 degrees. So what would be its supplementary angle? Well, we can take 180 degrees, subtract our 70. 0 minus 0 is 0. 8 minus 7 is 1. 1. We're looking for an angle that is 110 degrees. There's only one angle here that equals 110 degrees, and that is angle A, B, C. So angle D, A, B and angle A, B, C are supplementary angles. Okay, I want to take a look now on this same page. So I'm just going to slide my paper up. Page 30, number 227. 227 says, this is kind of like a story problem here. One angle is three times another. The two angles are complementary. Find the measure of each. So we have one angle, and I'm just going to call it angle X. And then the other angle is three times of that. So we've got another angle that is three times X. And together, because that's what complementary means, they equal 90 degrees. Okay, do you see how I set that up? One angle is three times the other. Together, the two angles are complementary. Now we need to find the measure of each angle. Well, this is an algebra problem at this point. Okay, x plus 3x is 4x. That equals 90. We divide both sides by 4, and that tells us that x equals 22.5 degrees. Remember, we're talking about degrees here. I calculator work. I did not do that in my head, by the way. So if our x is equal to 22.5 degrees, then what is our 3x? Well, you could simply just take 3 times x, right? So one angle, let's just call it angle 1, is equal to 22. Oh my gosh. 22.5 degrees, right? So what is angle 2 equal to? Well, if you take your calculator and multiply it uh, 3 times 22 and a half, you'll get that that is 67 5 degrees. Now, if you add these together, they should and will equal 90 degrees, all right? So that's how we do that story problem, okay? One angle is three times the other, and they are complementary, which means added together, they equal 90 degrees, okay? Break down these story problems bit by bit. I want to look at a couple more of these story problems. So on page 31, we're going to take a look at um, 229. And 229 tells us that we have an angle and it measures 3x minus 10 degrees. And its complement, remember what that means, has a measure of 2x plus 20 degrees. Okay, and they want you to find the measure of each angle. Well, remember that complements mean added together, they equal 90. So we know that 3x minus 10 degrees plus 20x plus 20 degrees equals 90 degrees, right? We can add our like terms. 3x plus 2x is 5x. Negative 10 degrees plus 20 degrees gives us 10 degrees. And they still equal 90. We're going to subtract 10 degrees from both sides. Cancels here. Our 5x falls down. 5x now equals 80 degrees, right? We divide by 5 on both sides to find out that x is equal to 30, or sorry, 16, <laughs> 16 degrees, okay? We solve for x. You put it in your calculator, you get 16 degrees. But x doesn't give us the measure of our angles, okay? Remember, we had one angle that was this and one angle that was this. All right, so we need to go and put this x back in. We need to substitute first 3 times 16 minus 10. And the other one was 2 times 16 plus 20. Okay, 3 times 16. Let's see here. 3 times 16 is 48 
minus 10, so we know that this angle is 38 degrees. Two times, oh my goodness, two times 16 is 32 plus 20, tells us this, this angle is 52 degrees. 52 plus 38 equals 90. Okay, they are complementary angles. They add up to 90 degrees. So those are your answers for number 29. Let's look at number 30. 2.30. It says an angle has a measure of 2x plus 20 degrees, and its vertical angle measures 5x minus 34 degrees. Find the measure of each angle. What do we know about vertical angles? We know that vertical angles are equal, right? Sorry about that. Vertical angles are equal, so we can set these equal to each other. 2x plus 20 degrees is equal to 5x minus 34 degrees. And now we solve this just like an algebra problem. I'm going to add 34 degrees to both sides. Okay, my 5x comes down. 20 plus 34 is 54 degrees. And I still have my 2x. Now I'm going to subtract my 2x from both sides. This time the 54 falls down and I'm left with 3x. We divide by 3 and we find out that x equals 18 degrees. Now, 18 degrees is our x, but remember, that's not our answer. We've got to go back up here and substitute. 2 times 18 plus 20. Now, these should work out to be the same. 5 times 18 minus 34, because remember, these are vertical angles. So let's pull out our calculator and say 2 times 18 is, of course, 36 plus 20. Tells us that this angle was 56 degrees. What about here? 5 times 18 is 90 minus 34. Okay. Oops. Oh, goodness sakes. 90 minus 34 is 56 degrees as well. I was going to show you on the calculator, but you just have to trust me. Okay. So our vertical angles are each 56 degrees. All right. So this is how we do some of these story problems that involves these adding and subtracting or setting things equal to each other um, problems. All right, I'm still on page 31, and I want to go over this proof with you. It says, write the reasons for the following proof. Here is the illustration that we're given, and we're given the information that the measure of angle 3 equals the measure of angle 4. And so they want us to prove that angle 1 and angle 2 are supplementary. Angle 1, angle 2. All right, they want us to prove that they're supplementary. So the first statement, and this is a lot how our proofs are going to look in the future as we, trust me, we're going to get to them and there's going to be a lot. The first statement is that the measure of angle 3 and the measure, or equals the measure of angle 4. Remember, that was our given information. So we label that given. That is our statement, is the fact that it was given, that information was given to us. Okay? All right, our second statement is that angle 2 and angle 3 are supplementary. So they're stating right off the bat that angle 2 and angle 3 are supplementary. What reason can we give for that being true? What reason from those theorems that we just looked at can we give for that being true? Well, it's theorem 3.2, right? Adjacent angles, opposite rays, supplementary angles, okay? Okay, so our next statement say it reads that the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 3 equals 180 degrees. Well, what's the reason behind that? We just said that they were supplementary, so we can set them equal to each other in a, an equation because that is the definition of supplementary angles, right? Supplementary angles means two angles added together equals 180 degrees. So now we've changed it over from words to an actual equation. And now in these equations, we can kind of take away and remove things, okay? 
Our next statement is that the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle four equals 180 degrees. Okay, here we had angle two and three equal to 180. Now we're saying that angle two and angle four equal 180 degrees. We can say that by substitution because we know that measure of angle three and the measure of angle four are equal. They are the same thing. So we can substitute that four where there was the three. Okay, and the reason for that is substitution. It's what it is. And we're going to use substitution as a reason a lot. Okay, the next statement tells us that the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle four. Let's look at our illustration. The measure of angle one equals the measure of angle four. If you took out the rest of the drawing, what do we have here? We have lines that are crossing each other, right? And when we lines cross each other, they make what kind of angles? that are opposite angles. That's right, vertical angles. So we can say that the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle four because vertical angles are equal. And I totally see that I spelled that wrong. Vertical angles are equal, okay? We know that from our definitions, that's what a vertical angle is, right? These two angles are vertical, therefore they are equal. All right, so we've gotten to the point where we've able to substitute angle four for our angle two. Now we know that angle four and angle two are supplementary. Well, we know that they equal 180 degrees. We haven't actually said that they're supplementary yet. And we've proven that angle one is equal to angle four. So what do you think they're gonna do next? Right. They said the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle one now equals 180. Because one and four are equal, we substituted angle one here where we were having angle four, okay? So now we've got the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle one equal to 180 degrees. Well, what two angle, when we add two angles and they equal 180 degrees, what are they called? They're called supplementary angles. One and two are supplementary angles. Now remember when we talked about proofs before, we always start with the given and we end with the to prove, right? We are proving that they are supplementary. And how are we proving that? Because that is the definition of supplementary angles, right? That when they're added together, they equal 180 degrees, okay? So that's the walkthrough of this proof to show that we go from the measure of angle three equal the measure of angle four, and we were able to walk it through to show that one and two are supplementary. Okay, this is kind of a big proof to get us started with, but I just wanted to walk you through it so you could see the steps out loud and hear how we're getting from one part to the other. All right, the next theorem we're looking at, it seems pretty basic, right? But it's theorem 3.8, and it says that all right angles are equal. All right angles equal 90 degrees. Therefore, all right angles are equal. And you might be thinking, well, that's kind of a silly thing to say out loud. But there it is. And you will use this theorem quite a bit. All right angles are equal. Now, up in this theorem, you can see I actually wrote theorem 3.2, right? But then I wrote out this theorem. It's probably better if you write out what the theorem stands for rather than the theorem number. Therefore, you're going to learn the actual theorem itself better than what number they've given it. I'm not really, I don't really care about the number. I want to know that you know what that theorem stands for, that vertical angles are equal. Or all, if you wrote all right angles are equal, I would rather see that answer than theorem 3.8. Okay, because then I got to go just double check what theorem 3.8 is. But if you write all right angles are equal, then I know you got it. All right, our last theorem for this week is theorem 3.9. And it tells us that if two lines intersect, forming at least one right angle, then the lines are perpendicular. So remember last time we talked about if the lines were perpendicular, then they formed right angles. Now we're doing the opposite, sort of. We're saying that if these two lines are intersecting and you're proving that this is a right angle, then those two intersecting lines are perpendicular. Okay, last time we started with perpendicular and it gave us 90 degree angles. Now we're saying if we know this is 90 degrees, 
then we can prove that these lines, or we can show that these lines are perpendicular lines. Okay, that's theorem 3.9. If two lines intersect, forming at least one right angle, then the lines are perpendicular. And you'll see that a lot with these theorems. You'll get a theorem that starts with point A and proves point B, and then you'll get the next one will be the theorem that starts with B and proves A. They're just opposites because you're not always going to get, they're not always going to give you, tell you that the lines are perpendicular. Sometimes they'll just tell you that such and such is a right angle. Well, if such and such is a right angle, then we know these lines are perpendicular. All right, that's theorem 3.9. All right, I want to go through a couple more problems before with you before we finish up this video. I'm on page 33, and we're going to look at 239 through 241. And it gives us this illustration, okay? It says, given the following diagram, complete these items. Realize that you've been given some information, that line AD is perpendicular to line BF. I'm going to go ahead and mark it as such, okay? Now, doing that, we can move forward. They want to know the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2. Well, here's angle 1 and here's angle 2. And what do we know about the space that they occupy? We know that the space that they occupy is a 90 degree angle, right? Because all of these angles around here are 90 degrees. So added together, they're complementary angles, right? Complementary means that they equal 90 degrees. 240 asks us if the measure of angle 1 is 60 degrees, then what is the measure of angle 2? Now remember, we just showed that together they equal 90. So if we take 90 and subtract 60, we'll find out that the measure of angle 2 is 30 degrees. Okay, they are complementary angles. They can never be anything more than 90 degrees, but they will always be together 90 degrees. 241, if measure of angle 3 equals 50 degrees, and I, I like to write lightly and I mark up my paper a lot, okay? They will give you this diagram and they will change the numbers a hundred different times. They'll tell you that angle 1 in the next problem is only 40 degrees and what's the measure of angle 2, okay? but I like to write it in there because I'm a visual person. So feel free to write in your paper, write into your diagrams, but don't do it dark because you're gonna wanna erase it and because they're gonna use it again later. It's a different number. So just lightly mark your paper as you go so you can keep track of what you're doing, all right? If the measure of angle three is 50 degrees, then the measure of angle four is what? Well, we know that three and four, just like one and two, are complementary angles. Right? They are inside adjacent angles inside perpendicular lines. So we know they're complementary. Well, complementary means they equal 90 degrees. So if I take 90 minus 50, I find out that the measure of angle 4 is 40 degrees. Okay? So keep going with those questions. There's a bunch more that are still about this diagram. You know, erase your notes and get ready for the next one but just take it one step at a time. All right, well, that's the end of this video for this week and the end of this section. You're doing a really great job. Keep up the good work. Until next time.